Before we get into the message tonight, I want to tell you a story about a lady. She was battling illness for a long time. She finally died, and she arrived at the gates of heaven. And while she was waiting for St. Peter to greet her, she peeked through the gates. She saw a beautiful banquet table. Sitting around it were her parents, friends who had recently died. They saw her. They began greeting her. Hello, how are you? We've been waiting for you. Good to see you. St. Peter came by. The woman said to him, this is such a wonderful place. How do I get in? St. Peter said, you have to spell a word. She said, well, what's the word? He said, love. She said, L-O-V-E. He said, exactly, and he welcomed her in. About two years later, St. Peter came to the woman, asked her to watch the pearly gates. While the woman was guarding the gates, her husband arrived. I'm surprised to see you, the woman said. How have you been? Oh, I've been doing pretty well since you died, he said. I married a beautiful young nurse who took care of you when you were ill. Then I won the lottery. I sold the little house that we lived in. I bought this big mansion. My wife and I traveled all around the world. We were on vacation, and I was water skiing when I had an accident. That's how I ended up here. How do I get in, he said. Well, you have to spell a word, she said. Well, what's the word? She said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> All right, tonight I am going to continue a series I began last week called, Yeah, But, and this is part two. And we talked about the fact that, have you ever had a conversation where you're trying to convince someone of something, they're listening, and all of a sudden you hear that phrase at the end, Yeah, But, and what it means is, I hear what you're saying but I have some opposing information that disqualifies it. So I began thinking about that in the area of healing. A lot of people are coming down with sicknesses and diseases in the world right now. And people always, when you talk about healing from the pulpit, they'll always say, yeah, but what about this? So go over to Matthew 9, and let's look at verse 35. This is the foundational text for this series. Matthew 9, 35, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages. Everyone say all. Say all a little louder. All right. All the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So when Jesus did that, he was showing the character and the nature of God, that it is God's will that we be healed. Now, when I say that, people say, yeah, but what about my grandma Rose or my aunt Sally or Uncle Joe? They had all kinds of faith, and they still died or they still encountered sickness. Well, obviously, I can't address those specific situations, but what we can do is look at what the Word of God says. So last week, we looked at the, yeah, but what about Paul's thorn in the flesh? And people thought that Paul had a physical infirmity and God wouldn't heal him. And I want to make this statement. Scriptural ignorance will hinder you from receiving God's promises in your life. Scriptural ignorance will hinder you from receiving God's promises in your life. If you believe that God put sickness or disease upon you, then you will do nothing to stand against it. In fact, I'll say it this way. If you believe that God put sickness and disease upon you, then it would be rebellion to go see a doctor because you'd be going against what you believe God put upon you. Now, obviously, we don't believe that, and we believe, listen, if I got to see a doctor, I'm seeing a doctor. If I break my leg, I'm not going to go through pain and agony believing God to heal it. I'm gonna, I don't like pain in my body, so I'm going to the doctor. What we found out with Paul is Paul's thorn in the flesh was not sickness or disease, but persecution. So tonight, I want to look at a yeah, but, and hopefully I can get through it uh, in one session here. Yeah, but... What about Job? Have you ever actually looked at that 
and thought, what's the deal about Job? Job is probably the most misunderstood and mistaught teaching in the Bible. And here's the premise, that God caused calamity and destruction to come upon Job to test his loyalty. And if he did it to Job, then he's going to do it to you as well. So that's what people get from that. Because Job endured to the end, he was awarded. So we all need to suffer for Jesus. Anyone ever hear that phrase? I'm just suffering for Jesus. And I always think, why? <laughs> why are you suffering for Jesus? So if you believe a lie long enough, it will become truth to you. So with that said, let's jump into this, and I'm going to go fast tonight. So take notes and look at it later. Job 1.1 says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. So when we read this, we think, oh man, Job was just a perfect guy. The Bible says he was blameless and upright. I think the King James says perfect. And people look at that and say, well, he was so amazing, it was unfair that all this happened to him. But let's look at that phrase, blameless and upright. It doesn't quite mean what you think. In the New Living Translation, it says, a man with complete integrity. CEB says the man was honest, a person of absolute integrity. The CEV says he was truly a good person. ERV says he was a good, honest man. The Good News Translation says he was a good man. And the Message Bible says he was honest inside and out. So we could say it this way. Job was a righteous, God-fearing man, but he wasn't perfect. Right? None of us are perfect. We all still make mistakes. Then in Job 1, verses 2 through 3, it says, And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So the Bible talks about his possessions. That's his substance, his wealth. And then it says he was the richest man in the East. So I took all those animals, plopped them into the computer, and said, what was that worth today if I owned all that stuff? This guy had in excess of $250 million dollars. Now, when I think of that figure, I'm thinking that guy's doing pretty well for himself. All right? He, 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 it paints a picture of someone that we would be envious of. So here's Job. He's got all these possessions, all this money. He's got a great life. And then in verses 4 and 5, and I'm going to read this from the God's Word translation, it says, His sons used to go to each other's homes where they would have parties. Each brother took his turn having a party, they would send someone to invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When they finished having their parties, Job would send for them in order to cleanse them from sin. He would get up early in the morning and sacrifice burnt offerings for each of them. Job thought, my children may have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So Job offered sacrifices for them all the time. Now, maybe you've read that and thought, okay. What's the big deal? Here's the red flag. Job's children were out of control, and he failed to discipline them. Nobody ever sees that. We just, oh, Job was blameless. He was upright. He did everything well. No, he didn't. He wasn't disciplining his children. The Bible says that Job offered sacrifices for them all the time. So this was a routine practice to sacrifice, burn offerings, and plead to God to forgive his children. He never attempted to stop them. Interesting. Well, what does the Bible say about bringing up your children? Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So that word train means to teach, to discipline, to instruct. It requires effort on your part as a parent. We can't just throw our kids in front of the TV and hope they come out well. 
I mean, when my kids were young, there was uh, Barney, the purple dinosaur. I mean, we knew our kids weren't going to come out well watching that guy. <laughs> so notice what it says, train up a child in the way, and way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So the premise is, if I train up my child good, they may end up backsliding, but when they're old, they'll come back to the Lord. That's not really what that's saying. The literal translation says it this way, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So the point is, if I bring them up the right way, they should have a better chance of sticking with the Lord. Then in Proverbs 23, 13, and 14, this will cause issues with some of the woke culture today. Do not hesitate to discipline a child. If you spank him, he will not die. Spank him yourself, and you will save his soul from hell. It is amazing how many Christians don't want to spank their kids. I actually have uh, some nephews, and they're, hopefully they're not watching, but if you are, maybe this will help you. Anyway, they bring their kids over to my mom's house, which that would be her grandchildren, and she says they're holy tears. And they're like, well, your kid needs a spanking. We don't believe in spanking. Really? Because I want to know from a biblical standpoint what other option of discipline exists. I don't see it, and the Bible says if you do it, you will save them from their souls. Now, we could do a whole parenting class on this, but what I'm trying to get you to see is God looks upon child rearing very seriously, and Job knew his kids were sinning, and he never directly dealt with them. He was not fulfilling his role as a parent, even though he was a good, honest, full of integrity person. This was an area in his life that was lacking. Now, let's look at verses 6 and 7. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came among them, and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. The Bible does not indicate where this meeting took place. We know that Satan was cast out of heaven. So it couldn't occur there. We don't know. We can only speculate and take it for what it says. But it says that the sons of God came to present themselves before God and Satan. Sons of God can be interpreted two different ways in the Bible. It can refer to human beings because Adam was called a son of God, or it could refer to angels. Since Satan is categorized among these people, then I would think it is referring to angels. And they were coming, and they were uh, appearing before God, uh, maybe to give a report of duty. Now, this is the first time in Scripture we see the word Satan used. Never used before this point. The word Satan means adversary or accuser. All right, let's look at verses 8 through 12. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Now, what I want you to see here is God is not like, Hey, here's a guy I want you to test and run through the mill. Because some people think that God may not do things to people, but he uses Satan to do his bidding. That's just plain ignorance. Why would God use the devil for anything? He rebelled against God. He cast him out. But what God is doing is he's bragging on Job. He's excited. I mean, like sometimes you brag on your kids. Hey, check out this guy. He's amazing. And look what Satan says. Satan says, does God or does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Now, that's good news for you as a believer, because even Satan realizes that God puts hedges around his righteous. 
that he is there to protect you. He is there to bless you. He is there to shield you from evil. Satan even recognized that. But then he said this, but now, and he's speaking to God, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Now, let me stop for a minute there. That word power means authority. So what God is saying is that all that Job has is in your authority. Satan obviously didn't catch that. Why would Job's possessions and everything that he has be under Satan's authority? We're going to see that in a minute. And then he goes on and he says, uh, Behold, all that he has is in your power, but only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. What I want you to understand is the Lord did not take the hedge down around Job. Job took it down himself. God does not take his hedge of protection off of you unless you choose to walk from it. Now, how did Job take this hedge of protection down around himself? Fear. He operated in fear. Let's look at that scripturally. Go to Job 3.25. Job 3.25. And Job makes a statement. Maybe you've heard this before. For the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Job became consumed with fear about whether something was going to happen to his children. I mean, he had all this money. Probably, was he going to lose his money? Was this going to happen? Was that going to happen? And when you enter into fear, faith leaves. So why did God allow this to happen? God has no choice if we open the door to fear. It is our choice to walk that way. And it wasn't God that does these things to Job. It's Satan. Let's look at verses 13 through 19. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the older brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with some news. Your oxen were plowing and with the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabians raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmlands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up all your sheep and all your shepherds. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrives and says, Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While that guy was still speaking, another messenger arrived. You think you've had a bad day? Another messenger arrived. Your sons and your daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness, hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed, and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. So in one day, Job loses his animals, his servants, and his children. And people will say, that's God testing him. That God will bring calamity into your life. He will cause accidents in your life to test you. No. The Bible says Jesus came that you might have life and more abundantly. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Let's look at verses 20 through 22. I'll read this from the ERV. When Job heard this, he got up, he tore his clothes, he shaved his head to show his sadness. Then he fell to the ground to bow down before God and said, When I was born into this world, I was naked and I had nothing. When I die and leave this world, I will be naked and have nothing. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of the Lord. Even after all this, Job did not sin. He did not accuse God of doing anything wrong. Now, 
Job didn't accuse God of doing anything wrong, but he believed God did it. He just didn't think it was wrong because he thought, well, the Lord can do whatever he wants, and if this is the way he wants to treat me, then I'm just his humble servant. So Job makes a statement there. It was funny because I was talking to Nicole before service. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. How many of you have ever heard that? All right, most of you. Hopefully, you haven't quoted that or taken that as a scriptural principle. There's a song sometimes people sing in worship, Blessed Be the Lord, and the lyric it goes, He gives and takes away, He gives and takes away. I cringe every time I hear that. Because Job is making that statement because he believes that God gave him all this stuff and then took it away, but it's God so he can do whatever he wants. What we need to understand is that the Bible contains a true account of everything that happened. However, not everything that is spoken by people is true. Yes, it is true that Job made that statement, but it is not scripturally accurate. But people see that in the Bible, and then when they lose things or things are happening, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Don't speak that over your life. Let's look at Job 2, verses 4 through 6. Satan comes back a second time to the Lord. He says, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Again, same thing. You have authority to do what you want, but spare his life. Why was Job's life off limits, but everything else wasn't? We'll go to Job 19, verses 25 through 27. Job 19, 25 through 27. This is Job speaking. He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another, how my heart yearns within me. You know why Satan could not take Job's life? Because he didn't fear for his life. He actually was welcoming the opportunity to see God. He feared everything else. He feared all the other stuff he was going to lose. But he had no fear over his life, so there was no open door for Satan to do anything there. Then in Job 2, 7 through 9, it says, So Satan left the Lord's presence. Who? It says, Satan left the Lord's presence, and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Now, let's look at a couple things here. First of all, who did the striking? Satan. Not God. Satan's the one that's been doing all this stuff to Job. But for some reason, people want to grab a hold and look what God did. Look what God did. People are going through all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm just suffering for Jesus. And they buy into this. God didn't give him the adversity, the adversary, the devil did. Now, while he's going through all this, and you know, I, I've had like, you ever get one of those pimples that's under the skin? Oh, man, those are nasty. They're painful. You can't even pop them. This guy is covered with boils from head to toe, and his wife says, curse God and die. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not the support system that I want from my spouse. <laughs> All right, you want someone that's going to encourage you. Then in Job 2.11, it says, when three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy he suffered, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Now, that would have been good if that's what they were actually doing, but I don't have time to get into the specifics. They weren't. Most people refer to these friends as Job's comforters. The problem is they came to have a pity party with him. 
Now, I don't know if you know what a pity party is. Maybe some of you had one and you didn't even know you were having it. That's where you don't invite people and you just wallow and look at how bad your life is. Oh, woe is me. I've got it so bad, don't I? And you agree with yourself. These guys came to back Job up about how bad it was. They weren't there to provide a solution, but to magnify the problem. Who needs friends like that? So Job begins to focus on his problems uh, about God rather than making, uh, looking at the truth, he begins making false statements. So I'm just going to read a couple. I'll read them quick, write them down. These are statements Job made. Job 3, 3 and 11. May the day perish on which I was born and in the night in which I said a male child is conceived. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Job 6, 4, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. See, he's still blaming God. My spirit drinks in their poisons. The tares of God are arrayed against me. And then Job 9, 16 through 17 and 22 through 24. Job 9, 16 through 17, 22 through 24. If I called and he, speaking of God, answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. It is all one thing, therefore I say, he destroys the blameless and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, he laughs at the plight of the innocent. The earth is given into his hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it not he, who else could it be? This is Job talking about God. If it not he, who else could it be? Hmm, let's see here. Uh, Satan? Satan, absolutely. So Job blames God, puts him in the league of the wicked, and if you go through the whole book of Job, he continues making all these statements about God. So let's go to the end, Job 32.1. So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. The Bible says Job was righteous in his own eyes, so he was blinded from seeing the truth. Then God sends a gentleman named Elihu to reveal Job's problem. In Job 34, 10 through 12, from the New Living Translation, he says, listen to me, you who have understanding. Everyone knows that God doesn't sin. The Almighty can do no wrong. He repays people according to their deeds. He treats people as they deserve. Truly, God will not do wrong. The Almighty will not twist justice. Job doesn't see his fault and fails to listen. So God himself shows up. Now, if God has to deal with you, it ain't pretty. So in Job 38, 1 through 5, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know or who stretched the line upon it? God accuses Job. If you read the next two chapters, it is God grilling him about all the things that he really doesn't know. God accuses Job of making false statements and accusations. In Job 40, 1 through 5, and 42, 2 through 6, it says, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? And at the end of 42, 6, he says, Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job recognizes his words, his heirs. He spoke words without knowledge. So if you look at the complete book of Job, 
You need to understand that it is a man rambling about what he doesn't understand. So we cannot take these scriptures and apply them as spiritual truth to our life. A lot of Christians make the same mistakes. They make crazy statements. God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. Actually, he can't. People will say, well, he's doing this to teach me something. He has his word to do that. Or I love this one, and I can't get into it tonight, but all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Now, there is a true way to interpret that, but if you get in a car accident, well, all things work together. Oh, I just got maimed for life. All things work together. No, you are not translating Scripture correctly. Let me end with this. Job 42, verses 10 and 16 through 17. Job 42, 10 and 16 through 17. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. Job ended up with twice as much as he had. And he had a lot to begin with. So, yeah, but what about Job? God didn't afflict Job. Satan did. Jesus came to provide life. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Never confuse the two. Amen?